All right. So my last video that I made failed. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of go over the notes uh, that I've already written down and kind of highlight things. I'll give you um, times to kind of pause and the video. And so that way you can like kind of do the problem on your own when I think you should do it on your own. And then you can restart the video and kind of proceed from there as I explain through things. Okay. And of course, at any time you can pause on your own and then just, um, um, you know, try it on, try it for yourself and then go back and see what I talked about. Okay. So, um, if you remember um, from yesterday, we had started to talk about the definition of the derivative and kind of get into calculus, right? And so we kind of um, went through a bunch of different things here. Let's see if I can get to find a start, starting point. Okay, so we started with the idea of trying to figure out how to solve the tangent line problem. That is how to come up with a um, way to calculate the slope of a line that is tangent to a function, right? Um, we started with the idea of trying to find the slope of a secant line. Okay, so a secant line is a line that intersects a function at two places, all right? And so it's easy to find the slope of a function when you have two points like this, or slope of a line when you have two points like this. You just use the slope formula, right? Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Of course, though, and that would yield the average rate of change, okay? Of course, then, how can we use this idea to help us then uh, come up with the slope of a tangent line? That is the slope of a line at a single point, right, of a single point of our function here. Well, with the way that we had set things up yesterday, remember, we kind of like tried to squeeze that delta x down and down and down and down until it approached zero so that this point would be drawn, drawn closer and closer and closer and closer, and the secant line would then get closer and closer and closer to approximating the tangent line slope, okay? And we did that using limits and then combining that together with the definition of the derivative to create the definition for the derivative of a function, or in other words, the tangent slope of a function, or just the slope of a function, or also the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, and then we showed how it worked for a couple of things, right? For example, for a line, right? We know the slope of a line is three, and of course, when we actually do the definition of the derivative to get the slope of the line using calculus, we end up with three as well. No surprise there. Right? Then for a function that's curved like this, we can see that the slope is not the same everywhere. Right Here we would expect negative slopes. Here at the very bottom, we'd expect the slope of zero. Here at the, to the right, we'd expect the slope of positive slopes. And in fact, that is what we see. Right At the point negative one, two, when we take the derivative of this function here at negative one, we get negative two for our slope. Okay, a negative slope there. And then at zero, we get a slope of zero. All right. Talk more about the derivative, finding the derivative of the function, okay? So not finding the derivative at a point, but instead just kind of finding the overall derivative of the function, which, in, for example, for the square root of x here, results in 1 over 2 times the square root of x. This was a generic formula that we used to describe the slope of the function f of x at any point x. And so any x value you pick along here, you can plug in and get the slope of your function. All right, so we did that, for example, at 1, 1. We found the slope at that point to be 1 half. At 4, 2, we found the slope to be 1 fourth. At 0, 0, we found it to be undefined, okay, which kind of makes some sense there because the function kind of stops abruptly at 0. We're going to talk more about that today. Then we did one more example here where we found the equation of a tangent line and another derivative and stuff, again, just using some techniques that we had seen um, previously in this class. So starting, that catches up to here to today where we're talking about differentiability and continuity. Okay, before we jump into the differentiability and continuity, though, we're going to talk about an alternate form um, of the derivative. Okay, so an alternative to that whole f of x plus delta x minus del f of x all over delta x kind of thing, or f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, or, you know, here we did f of t plus delta t minus f of t all over delta t. And the alternative way to find the derivative is, is this form right here, where if we want to find the value of the derivative at a specific point c, we can do that by taking the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Subtly different, right? Subtly different from that other limit definition that we've used, but it also works. Okay, you can see it's actually just the slope formula, right? You have, you know, y minus y over x minus x, okay? But again, primarily used to find the value of the derivative at a particular point. Okay, we really don't use it so much to get the value, uh, to get like the generic formula of the derivative like we did here for the previous example. Okay, so we went through that and did that. For example, two, you can see here, um, f of x equals x squared plus one, and we're asked to find f prime of one. This is just from example two. 
using the alternate form here, you can kind of see how we ran through it. So we set everything up. You know, negative 1 is our C value that we want to approach. We plug that negative 1 in for the C's here and also for our limit. And then we evaluate. F of x is x squared plus 1. So there it is showing up right there. F of negative 1 is 2. Okay. So x squared plus 1 minus 2 gives us x squared minus 1. The x minus 1 is from that x minus negative 1 there becomes x plus 1. And so then we can factor and cancel here to continue simplifying. And we solve and get that negative 2 is, again, the slope we arrive at. Okay, so then um, some illustrations here. At this point, you should pause the video and go through um, these 1, 2, 3, and 4 examples here. Graph those, okay? Graph them. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that you graph these. We're going to kind of talk through these a little bit. In these examples, our goal is to determine the intervals in which the function is continuous and the intervals in which the functions are differentiable. Okay, so what do we mean by differentiable? We mean we are able to take or evaluate the derivative at you know, any particular point, or in, or in other words, you can think, does the slope of the function exist? Okay, so looking here, for example, at 1 over x, you can see that um, the function okay, is not continuous at 0, right? It has a vertical asymptote. And therefore, we would expect that it will be not differentiable also at 0 because, well, if you, the function doesn't exist, then you won't be able to find the slope of the function at that exact point too. So here, since the function does not exist at 0, we wouldn't expect the derivative to exist either because there's, well, there's nothing there for it to, to you know, equal. There's nothing there for us to evaluate. Okay? So you can't find the slope of f where f doesn't exist. <coughs> Moving on here to number 2, okay, this absolute value function this is continuous everywhere, but there is a place where it is not differentiable, okay? And the place where that is is right here at the vertex of that um, absolute value function, okay? If you uh, think um, one way about this, right, to the left of the vertex, all the slopes, all the derivatives along here, all the values of the derivatives at each point would be a negative 1, right? Because the slope of this side is negative 1. The slope of this side is positive 1. And so at that vertex, we're suddenly switching from a slope of negative 1 to a slope of positive 1. And so, in other words, the derivative value is um, impossible to determine, right? Um, again, the derivative is known as a limit. So if you think about, you know, the limit here at this point, well, from the left, we're going to get a value of negative 1. From the right, we're going to get a value of positive 1 for the derivative. But then at that particular point, the left and right hand disagree, and so the overall limit does not exist. And that's kind of... Uh, described here. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f prime of x is negative 1, from 2 from the right of f prime is 1. They don't agree, so the limit as x approaches 2 of f prime just does not exist. And so we would say it's not differentiable from negative infinity to 2, or sorry, it's differentiable from negative infinity to 2 union 2 to infinity. So in other words, we have to exclude x equals 2 where that vertex is. Moving on to 3, okay. Uh, this graph here of x to the one-third, you can kind of see the graph here. And the issue here is that at zero, we're going to end up with a vertical tangent. Okay? In other words, the slope will be undefined. The slope of this function is undefined at zero. Okay? Again, it's continuous everywhere. No x value um, will give you any problem when you plug it in. But if we take f prime of zero here using that alternative form of the derivative that we talked about before, you can follow through the work here and see that we result in some, a limit where we can't simplify it any further, and so by direct substitution, we end up with 1 over 0. In other words, the limit does not exist. It's going to be undefined. And so since the limit, um, the derivative, the definition of the derivative, its limit doesn't exist, okay, the limit definition of the derivative doesn't exist, then the function um, is not differentiable at 0. And so we exclude 0 from our differentiability. And then finally, for number 4, the piecewise function here, uh, ignore this, I made a mistake Earlier, I fixed it here, though, so it looks right now. So there's our two pieces Okay, for the piecewise function. Again, it is continuous everywhere. The two pieces do join up at 1, and so it is continuous everywhere. <coughs> but we, again, run into a similar situation to what we had with the absolute value function, where we suddenly change from a negative 1 slope to a positive 1 slope. Here, we're changing from suddenly from a negative 2 slope to then, at this point, from the right, the limit is x approaches 1 from the right of f prime of x, which is um, using the limit definition of the derivative here. I took the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, using, again, that alternate form of the derivative, um, f of x minus f of 1 over x minus 1. Okay, the function in this case, since we're approaching from the right, we want to use the bottom piece of our piecewise function, the x squared. So it's x squared minus 1 squared over x minus 1. Again, simplify, uh, factor, and cancel, and you end up with 2. From the left, the derivative was giving us a slope of negative 2. From the right, the derivative is giving us a slope of 2. And so since they disagree, the limit overall does not exist. All right, so if you go back and think about this, okay, if we go back and look at this here, at first glance, it might seem like 
where the function is continuous, it will also be differentiable, right? Like we see right there. But it doesn't follow here, right? Just be, the function is continuous everywhere, but not differentiable everywhere. <clears throat> Same here. Continuous everywhere, not differentiable everywhere. Continuous everywhere, not differentiable everywhere. So how are these things related? Well, <clears throat> as it turns out, if f is differentiable at a particular point, then f will also be guaranteed to be continuous at x equals c. So what does that mean? Well, these intervals of differentiability, aren't they also included in our continuity, right? This interval here of differentiability, isn't that also included within our continuity? Differentiable intervals con are con included in the continuous intervals. Differentiable intervals are included in the continuous intervals. So in other words, <clears throat> it is differentiability that decides whether something is also continuous. If a function is differentiable, then we guarantee that it will be continuous. Okay? But it's not the other way around. If a function is continuous, that does not necessarily mean it's differentiable. And again, you can see examples right here. This function is continuous, right? This function is continuous, but it's not differentiable everywhere, okay? So in summary, if a function is differentiable at x equals c, then it is continuous at x equals c. Thus, differentiability implies continuity, right? Key idea there, all right? It is possible for a function to be continuous at x equals c and not be differentiable at x equals c. Thus, continuity does not imply differentiability. And so you can see here these um, examples. Absolute value of x, piecewise functions. Those can have sudden changes in slope, right? So you want to watch out for that. Um, x to the 1 third, x to the 2 thirds. Their graphs can result in some vertical tangent lines. So again, keep that in mind, OK? The big idea that you want to think about is that differentiability, when you describe the differentiability, it's essentially describing the continuity of the derivative, OK? If your derivative is discontinuous, your function um, I'm oh, sorry, if your derivative is continuous, then your function will always be continuous there, okay? That's, in other words, differentiability implies continuity. Moving on. Okay, here's a little example, something that you should try. So again, graph this piecewise function <coughs> on your paper, and then answer the questions below. Okay, I'm going to assume that you've already gone through and answered those questions. So here is the graph of the piecewise function you can see there. Um, and then we'll go through some of these answers here. All the values x such that f is continuous. f is continuous everywhere except at 6, right, where we have that jump discontinuity. Everywhere else it is continuous. Okay, so just a 6 we exclude there. This right here, this is the limit definition of the derivative. That's our old version of the limit definition of the derivative. <clears throat> You'll notice that the x's are replaced by 1's. So in other words, we are evaluating the derivative of this function f at 1. Well, if you go to your graph here, at 1, the slope of this little line here is a 1, right? Because it's the absolute value of x graph, so it's a slope of up 1, right 1. So that's why we get 1 there. No need to evaluate anything using limit definition. Okay, you can see it's just that old version of the limit definition of the derivative. Just the x's are replaced by a 1. So we're evaluating the derivative at 1. C is asking the same kind of question, but just in a different way, asking f prime of 4. What is f prime of 4? So we go to 1, 2, 3, 4. Here it is on our graph. What is the slope of the function on that graph? It's negative 1 half, right? At that interval, the slope here is all along negative 1 half. So that's why I get negative 1 half there. Then going 0 from the left and, well, sorry, then approaching 6 from the left and 6 from the right here, okay? 6 from the left is a negative 1 half slope. 6 from the right is a negative 1 half slope. So you may be tempted then to say that the derivative exists everywhere, but it does not, okay? And here's why, all right? So find all values of x such that f is differentiable. Well, the function is not differentiable here, right? Again, it's got a point, suddenly changed from negative 1 to positive 1. The slopes do. Here, the function's also not differential because the slopes change from 1 to negative 1 half. So again, not at 2 either. And then finally, at 6, although the slopes from the left are negative 1 half and the slope from the right is negative 1 half, the function is still not differential at 6 because if a function is not continuous, then it also is not differential. Okay? So that is just the contrapositive way of saying what we said earlier. Remember, earlier we said differentiability implies continuity. If differentiable, then continuous. The equivalent statement, an equivalent logical equivalent statement to that is the reverse and negated. So again, if differentiable, then continuous is equivalent to saying if not continuous, then not differentiable. So here, since our function is not continuous, it cannot be differentiable there. Moving on. Okay, so constant rule. Taking the derivatives now, we're going to learn some shortcuts. Okay, and I'm running short on time, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, so here, again, example one, you can see me use the limit definition of the derivative to um, find the derivative of the line of graph of function y equals 7. So here you can take a look at that. All right, so if you need to pause it, pause it, and just kind of read through it, and then you can listen to what I have to say. 
But you can see that as we take the derivative here, we end up with a value of zero, which should make sense because what is the graph of y equals seven? It's a horizontal line. And so if we graph a horizontal line, what's the slope of any horizontal line? It's zero. So the constant rule, anytime we take the derivative of a constant, that is any number, so like seven, 10, 100, e, yes, e is a number, um, the derivative of those things is going to be zero. Okay, so in other words, the derivative of c, a constant with respect to x, is just zero. Okay, so now we have that rule, we don't need to do the limit definition. Anytime we see a number and we want to take the derivative of it, it's just going to be zero. Okay, moving on. At this point, what I would suggest you do is pause the video and then take the derivative of x cubed, x squared, and or x to the one half using the limit definition of the derivative. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. And then um, you can look here. I've done the x cubed one for us. We end up with 3x squared. Uh, I also uh, took, the took the answer from other students, 2x to the 1 for letter B. And the derivative um, for h of x is 1 half x to the negative 1 half when you rewrite it a little bit. Okay, now you'll notice a pattern here, right? x to the third becomes 3x to the 2. x to the 2, its derivative becomes 2x to the 1. And h of x, its derivative, which is x to the 1 half, becomes 1 half times x to the negative 1 half. The pattern here is that whenever you take the derivative of x raised to a power, you get um, that, that power goes out front, and then you lower the power by 1. So the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1 power. And that's true in general. So we can use that here in a variety of problems. All right. So for example, here we have pi squared. Now pi squared, which rule does that follow? Well, it's a constant. Pi to the second is a number. So what, it will be a horizontal line when you graph it. And it, when you take its derivative, then it will be 0. Okay. Here, cube root of t. You want to rewrite that as t to the one-third, and I will pause this video and add on to it um, later.